Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsanan ila yawmiddin wa alayna ma'ahum wa fihim bi rahmatika ya rahmanir rahimeen. Did you do the niyat at the beginning of your session? Yeah, I missed the phone. But you did them, yeah. Okay, alhamdulillah. We intend what uh, Stad Amjad intended and our shayukh and then Imam Hujjah to Islam and Ghazali and Shaykh Abdurrahman al Shaghuri and their rijal insha'Allah ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our intentions and their intentions and our works and their works. Um, and alhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallam ala rasulillah bismillah wa billah wa min Allah wa illallah and alhamdulillah forgive these few minutes I was here at 11.15 and I actually prefer Kairos time, not Kronos time. But if something's on Kronos, great. Bismillah. But I had, no one was here, so I, I had some sunnahs I needed to do. And then um, someone I met in probably 1997 or 8 in a garden of the Ghulta outside of Damascus in the company of Sheikh Abdurrahman al Shaghuri and his Khadim Abu Munir and a brother from Chicago named Ali Antar Abdul Abdurrahman. They were passing through visiting, and it was a very, do you remember that, that picnic we went on? Oh, uh, terrible memory. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, and I remember, uh, so, you know, Sayyid al-Habib, I remember one time he was injured. His car flipped, um, and he had some sort of maybe, you know, torso injury. I don't know if it was back or what, but he was a little sore. So he had to sit in a chair for a majlis. He didn't normally sit in a chair. Normally, most of our majalis are all on the floor in a halakha, in a musalla, numerous halakha. Actually, if you tune into his majalis, you'll hear the other halakha. Um, not a lot of uh, pomp and circumstance, and uh, a lot of tawadwa, right? And that is their way. The way of Asada al Balawi is tawadwa and khumul. Um, and their grandfather preferred that for them. He chose that for them. Ahmed bin Isa al Muhajir Allah. He took them out of Iraq, out of immense wealth and prestige, to an arid desert valley, um, and by that protected this that we've been bequeathed and are being bequeathed. Um, so, Sayyid al Habib, like usually, if he had to be put on a chair, the roha has become a little bit different, and that's a medjus that that's for that, and obviously, like a mimbar, that's a medjus. But he would always ask one of the elders, bring a second. I'm not going to sit up unless you bring a chair. And one of the elders is going to sit up with me. My Sheikh Muhammad Isawaili is gray-haired, older than me. I met him. He was, you know, already on that path with people that, that those are our brothers for Allah's sake. Sheikh Abdurrahman. So, you know, we have to learn that there's a code that transcends all of this other stuff. This Muslim circuit, these things the marketers want us to do, the filmers want us to do, that's fine. We're going to cooperate with you, like I said. Put the mic where you want it. But we have a code that we took from, from men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're bound by that. And we're charged with that, and we must adhere to that. So may Allah give us that, inshallah ta'ala. Give us to be men and women of honor, of wafa. And from that, our brother for Allah, Shaykh Yahya. And our brother for Allah, our Sayyid, Abdul Fattah. They can't be with us right now for other reasons. So inshallah, I want everyone to intend representing them. You know, you get the back of the people you love. And you never forget that. Rasulullah will not forget any of us, the Umm Qiyamah. He'll get your back when no one else can. And the elites after Allah's Messenger gets everyone's back in the creation, they'll get many of our backs. The likes of Shaykh Abdul Rahman, Rahimahullah. That's our dhan of him. The likes of Shaykh Abdul Wakil, right? The likes of Habib Adi Mashhur, Rahimahullah. The likes of Habib Muhammad bin Salam bin Hafid. And we hope to die loving them, you know? That's the thing. If you want to die loving them, that will open you to all of this. They'll say, oh, where's my brother or sister who I love for Allah? They're at a lower station. Allah, bring them up to the station. Their wudu is down there. Our wudu is up here. Allah, bring them up what our wudu, Allah, because of love. So that's a big deal. We want to honor these things. And otherwise, we'll do what everyone else has done in this country. We're not now, if you're watching online, I'm in the United States, so-called. Um, 
will sell out to corporations. We'll let people who have a material, monetary, quantifiable bottom line trespass and begin to define value for us. Medicine's done it. Education has done it. Arts have done it. The ch churches have done it, some of them. Right? We don't want to surrender these values to other than, uh, to surrender our hearts and our perception of value to other than the proper stewards of that. Right? We want to adhere to that. And part of that is honoring these relationships. Um, they, they are more important than, um, than many other things. They're from the most important of things. Um, and they're cables that connect us to all of this. It's a cable right to Allah's Messenger, who speaks on behalf of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the great links in this cable is Ali Imam Ghazali. And there's another point. This, after the Quran and the Hadith, that in a sense, you know, that's Allah's word. It's from his, the attributes of his essence, beginningless, eternal. That's the book of Allah. The sayings of Prophet Muhammad, khalas, they're that explained and translated into human form. This is my favorite book. This is my favorite book in the whole world. It's the best book in Islam if you understand the book in the Sunnah. Imam Anawi, the likes of them have statements like that. Sheikh Ibn Hajar, a great late Shafi'i jurist, a great, great jurist, a tough jurist, right? When we say that, Ibn Hajr hates me, you say Al-Makki, not Asqalani. Asqalani is a Hadith scholar. Ibn Hajr said, if all of the books of the Shafi school were lost, you could take them from here. You could take them back out of Ihya. Having said that, we, I would like to direct our attention to a very important point that we took from the Shuyukh that we take this book from. And that is that we're not taking this knowledge from this book. The knowledge that I ask Allah to give us to all take you're not taking it from this book. A nice uh, perspective uh, uh, explanation that Dr. Omar Abdullah Farooq gave, Allah Yahfadu, said knowledge isn't taken from books, it's stored in books. So having said that, this is one of the great repositories of knowledge of the Sharia, of Muhammad Sallallahu However, where does the knowledge come from? And this goes back to the point I made. We're taking knowledge from Sheikh Yahya Rodas. You're taking knowledge from Sayyid Abdul Fattah Ba'alawi, from Ustad Amjad Tarsin, from Sheikh Muhammad Isa Waili, from that which they took from the elites they witnessed and that they witnessed. And it's a real living tradition. I could tell you that I could feel it while I was sitting, reviewing for my lesson, listening to Ustad Amjad, sitting over in the neighborhood with some of my family. I was in his lesson in Ihya, Daughters made coffee for me and some dates to save me some time and see them. I could feel the senate that exists here. There's an idhan here, right? And, and going back to those points, don't violate that and honor it, right? Because it's, it's, it's really immense and it's really beautiful, but violations are severe and can be very grave. And those that took from the shuyukh, like one of someone asked us about one of these things, it was related to like what we did today. You know, old elders have to be honored. Sada have to be honored. Knowledge has to be honored. Quran has to be honored, right? Um, that if I, at a certain point in time, I had some, some disciplinary actions from some of my shiuch. So I said to this older man uh, that, you know, I asked to like sit like that or something. I said, you know, my shiuch have a long stick. And I was in California at the time, but he understand the point that I meant. That if you step out of line, they will spank you. Right? They will spank you, so, uh, and that's good, right? Why have a son, he tries to run out of the house now. And we live close to a freeway service drive, so my, mom's like, my wife's like, you know, we're going to have to give him a pop-pop. He has to understand that he can't run out in the street. It could be terrible, right? There's pit bulls in our neighborhood and stuff. So same thing, you're shiuch, yani, you step. They'll give you a little reminder, Allah will give you a reminder, and alhamdulillah for the believers, that's a good thing. So um, understand, that's what we're going to work on. We're going to work on taking from the Senate of Sheikh Yahya and others with the idhan that was given from the Sharia of Nabi Muhammad, and this is one of the great repositories of that. Um, but, but what you're taking is beyond the, the words that are stated to you. 
is something else. If we really tap into it, it's something else. And inshallah, you all feel that. Um, and may Allah expand it more. And if Allah really opened it, you might see Alam Imam Ghazali. Might come to you in a dream and say, I'm so glad you all read my book. Right? Like uh, some of them said, and it was, I don't know if it was Utba al Ghulam or, uh, or uh, Ikrimah. Is one of them, one of the early folks, Imam Ghazali, I believe, quotes it. I continued to repeat the ayah until I heard it from the one who spoke it. Right? He heard it from either Allah's messenger or Allah gave him a, you know, a ladunni manifestation that blew him away. I believe he fainted as a result. Right? So don't, don't, don't miss the forest for the trees. Right? Understand uh, that the transmission of the Nabi Muhammad continues. So with that, uh, we are in a section that the Imam calls al qismu thani taharatul ahdath Purification from uh, hada, ahdath is the plural of hadath, and that is states of ritual impurity. So there's two types of purification that are required, and they, sometimes they just unite them as one because it's both purity, but sometimes they break them into two. Purification from anjas, that's physical filth, that's what we talked about, right? And uh, there's probably, you could say, kind of an, an epilogue of that was what Amjad covered, but it's the beginning of the next, right? That's physical things. Excretions, you got to purify yourself from that. But then there's ritual purity, and that's ahdath, and that is the things that cause ritual impurity, which is what causes wudu to be obligatory, or ghusl to be obligatory, or tayammum um, as an, a replacement for those in certain circumstances. So he says, taharatul uh, ahdath, purification from these states of ritual impurity. So here he's going to mention wudu, ghusl, tayammum, and prior to that he's going to mention how to do istinja, which was discussed, alhamdulillah, we followed what uh, Stad Amjad was mentioning. And um, there was a point that if you're taking notes, I would encourage myself and you to think about, and it was a fet, I believe. At around 50, Ustad Amjad, he was mentioning, you don't do a stinja inside, you do outside. And it was, uh, may Allah bless him. And as we said, I, this is in covered in it. This, this work is enveloped by permission of elite. And your works will be enfolded in their works. You'll make mistakes teaching and it will be covered up. The, the stream will drop. It's just like, wow, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, so he said, uh, people get affected by their own preferences. I want to wash inside instead of outside. He said, leave it and move on. That is, a, that is what he keeps alluding to, what we're going to treat in the end. That's like a cornerstone of all of this in the Sharia. You're a slave. It's not about what you like or think or want. It's about totally subverting that and following the Prophet So you become like him, right? So if you become like him, you're like how Allah loves. So then you're beloved. But you're not good. I won't become like him and you won't become like him if we always have our own blasted ideas that we put ahead of his sunnah. But if you recognize, well, that's a blasted idea if it doesn't conform to the Sunnah of Muhammad. And as Ustad Amjad said, leave your own preference for what he taught. That is an opening for you. You're humbling yourself before the one who Allah raised and made beloved and following his path. And Allah promised you, if you closely follow him, Allah will love you. Fattabi'uni yahbibkum Allah, as Allah says in Surah Al Imran. So that's another, th that's, this is a, something of a digression, but I wanted to emphasize that point. I was following, I'll try to follow all of his sessions. Um, inshallah, I just drove in, so I was really exhausted. I, inshallah, I'll get myself together, and I'll be sitting here, because sitting here physically is, is, is different than being online. But in any case, uh, alhamdulillah, we wanted to point your attention to that. Um, that's an opening. And then we want you to point you to your attention to one other thing. So he talks about... Um, like basically, this is uh, how to do these, these works and their etiquettes. We're going to charge ourselves with focusing on wudu. And we've been given a, little, a few extra minutes. We're, we've been given about 15 extra minutes. We'll see how the time flows. We may need to use them. Um, wudu is really important. We're going to focus on wudu. Um, and we might mention some of the others, especially just a point about where to really access the details of those. Um, but he says... Uh, we mentioned the the, 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 how to do these works, their order, their etiquettes, 
their sunnas, wudu, istinja, ghusl, all of that. He said we mentioned that. Starting with the cause of wudu, the sabab al wudu. Mubtadi'ina bi sabab al wudu wa huwa qada al haja, insha'Allah ta'ala. So, what it, so that's a point. You have to learn what breaks you will do, what causes it to be obligatory to perform will do again when you are obliged to pray or do something else that has uh, purification. Right? So understand, all he does is by illusion. That whole chapter is absent. That's a chapter in a book of law. This is a, this is, this is a renewal of the religion. This is a tajdeed, and his audience was largely jurists who knew all of this stuff. But, as we stated, you don't want to miss the forest for the trees. They had missed the forest for the trees. So it was a way to debate. It was a way to gain favor with the emperors. It was a way, if you were a Qadi, to become wealthy and prestigious. So he took them back to the way of the hereafter. Um, but he assumes many things in this work. So as we stated yesterday, this isn't how you learn the details of how to do this. You learn the details of how to do this in Al-Aktari or Ibn Ashr. Right or in uh, or in Marakiya Saud if you're Hanafi or in or in uh, some of them like Wudu in Risal al Jamia some of these that are later you'd have to go a couple books up like uh, Muqaddim al Hadramiya would have all of this so um, and and that book that's like level four or five Imam Haddad says that's a f- sufficient for a traveler on the way to hereafter or Salik right someone traveling to Allah Muqaddim al Hadramiya is sufficient. Um, not for a mufti, it's not. If you're going to answer other people's questions, you need more, but for your own journey, you need that. So what the point we're making again, you got to have a lesson in the law, if you haven't already. This is the law of the Nabi Muhammad. This is how you leave your preference for his way. That's how. You learn, when, was, when Ibn Asher says this, I do that. Right? Murak Asud says this, I do that. That's what I do, because that's what they understood from the Sunnah of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa And if I follow the Sunnah of Muhammad, Allah will love me, and that's my goal. Right? That's my goal. May Allah give us that. Allahu Akbar. So then he said, Adabu, Quran, Hajj, we're skipping all of that. But I just wanted to mention that one point, that that is, uh, that is, you got to know the asbab, right? What would cause, and, and it sounds simple, but I've had people pull me aside in Masajid and say, well, what exactly breaks will do? You know, we're getting ready to pray. This person maybe hasn't spent a lot of time with seekers of knowledge, knows a seeker of knowledge is coming through who could teach him this. Jazahallahu khairan. But not everybody knows. And not everybody pays attention. Um, so we got to learn that. And if you know that, Allahu Akbar, then just know that you knew some great things from the Sharia of Nabi Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we all need and will benefit us in this world and the next. May Allah give us to, uh, to do that. Um, la ilaha illallah. So then he says, Kefiyat al wudu, Allahu Akbar. Um, and this is, and I'm, no, here it is. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. So he says, Kefiyat al wudu. Um, uh, so then he says, and this, this first hadith is like, I ask Allah to give me to do this. If you do this, it'll be a fet in your saluk. You'll find, you will find huge benefit if you do this. And I say that as someone who maybe spent years not working on it as much as I should have, and who recently has been reminded of it, and I've just found it like huge, greatly helpful. Uh, he says, when you finish istinja, right, you've relieved yourself, which we all have to do, and Stad Amjad, he mentioned, you know, this is unpleasant to talk about, but it's biologically essential. This, that's part of your humanity while you're on the earth. Just look at the pandemic. What happened? In this country, bullets, because it's a violent place. We couldn't find any bullets. And then something that relates to the fitr of the human being can't find any toilet paper. Like, let's not kid ourselves that it's unimportant. Just look at the pandemic. It shows you where people's priorities are. Here, when you're an invader that has to defend the territory you stole from people, you need a lot of bullets. Right, because you're scared of what will happen if those people ever are able to, you know, get out from under your system. But everybody, you need to learn how to clean yourself, right? So that's important. When you finish that, uh, then focus on wudu. Falam yura, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam qat kharajan min al-ghaiti illa tawadda. This is related by Ibn Majah. Allah's, this is a huge sunnah. Allah's messenger was not ever seen leaving the lavatory except that he made wudu. Right? That is a sunnah of Allah's messenger, to remain pure. Right? And some of the benefits of that are going to be mentioned later. So like, if there's a sunnah I would say, take from today, this sunnah. Whenever you relieve yourself, make wudu. You know, get you some of those uh, seal skins or wudu socks. Make it easier for yourself if you work, right? And wudu is hard on the nafs. Your nafs does not like wudu. And things being heavy on the nafs, I mean, what does that mean? In more simple terms, it takes discipline to always make wudu, right? Honestly speaking, especially in the beginning, it took, like, you could get to a point where you love wudu. But it takes, that takes some mujahada. Why do you love it? Because your heart's more like Prophet Muhammad now, sallallahu And he loved it. But at first, your nafs did not like to do that. Many of us, maybe you're a pure, soft-hearted person, maybe. I, I wasn't like that. For me, it took mujahada, right? Um, so you're making a mujahada, but this is a really good mujahada. It will help you and I, it'll help I and you in so many things. Uh, so then he mentions another Im uh, important sunnah, and we're going to read these hadiths about it. He says, then begin siwak. This is a siwak. Your toothbrush is a siwak. If I, if I were in a pinch, this is a little bit coarse. This is a siwak. Sometimes you've got to use that. Your washcloth, you know, you come from a culture, we use washcloths. Somebody's going to shower, you're going to have a washcloth. You're making wudu in the shower, your washcloth is a siwak. Anything abrasive that's not attached to you and it's pure can be used as a siwak. Siwak is the name of rubbing your teeth um, and, it's in, and what's around them, your gums and tongue and palate and stuff, and its instrument, right? So all of those can be used as siwaks. Uh, this is the best plant for it because it's, uh, Prophet Muhammad taught us that. It's called a rock, but it's not the only type, right? You could go out on one of these oaks or maples and take a twig and make yourself a siwak. Um, and if you're in a pinch, do that. That would be good. Especially maple, if you had one that had a nice flavor or, or aroma, that would be sunnah. That would be ahead of something without, right? You can also use, uh, they use in, in the environment the Prophet was in, they use date palm and, 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 and zaytun. All of those are mansus alay. But then they say everything with a good fragrance, right? And then everything rough. Um, so he began with siwak. And we're just going to read these hadiths from Rasulullah. The Prophet وسلم, said, um, Surely your mouths are the passages of the Quran, so make them good and pure, bisiwak. In the afwahakum turukul Quran, fatayyibuha bisiwak. That is narrated by Ibn Majah, and that stops on Sayyidina Ali, right? Uh, and it's also narrated in a similar phrase by Al Bazar, and that, that phrase is raised to the Prophet. So he taught us a deep uh, meaning of getting your, your, your mouth ready to recite the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Angels receive the Qur'an from your mouth when you're reciting in Salah. So you want to do that without hygiene? Right? That wouldn't be reverent. We want to show reverence to Allah's word. And that's what matters. Right? He created your, both states of your mouth. He loves when your breath is bad from fasting. Subhanahu. So it's not the physical thing, but there's a meaning behind that of Allah's command and reverence to what should be revered. And the Qur'an is from that which should be revered. Right? Um, and really, you know, I kind of charge myself and Ustad Amjad and, you know, benefit from the charge of the likes of my uncle that we have a, a custodianship from the men we met and took from to preserve the sacred. But you all have a custodianship from Rasulullah. This is a profane age, Yanni. It's an, there's an irreverence in the world now. If, if the believers from the Ummah of Muhammad are not going to be the custodians of that. Who's going to be the custodians of that? Right? And he told us that, right? All of you. Right? So we have a responsibility. Um, we should be reverent to Allah's book. And from the reverence of reciting it is that you begin with siwak. Um, and he said, Right? So make a good intention. Not... You know, I'm doing this because my coworkers would think my breast stinks. No. I mean, you might do that. There's times for that. Uh, and there's etiquette in not offending people. 
But look at the difference between someone who's doing it to recite Allah's book, and you're always reciting. You're going to pray, right? So make good intentions. Attach, attach yourself to lofty intentions to recite Al-Fatiha, the greatest surah of, of the Qur'an that includes all of the meanings of the Qur'an and dhikr of Allah Ta'ala, fis salah. Um, la ilaha illa Allah's Messenger Sallallahu said, Salatun ala athar al-sidaq, afdalu min khamsin wa sab'ina, salatan bi ghayri siwaq. That is a riwayah of Ahmad. The riwayah that I memorize, um, that I'm confident in its strength, is um, rakatani bi siwaq, khayrun min sab'ina raka bi ghayri siwaq. Two rakas with siwaq is better than 70 without. It's at least hasan, if not sahih. And don't be deluded by uh, some of the Wahhabiyah that might tell you the hadith is weak. We just recently re researched it because someone said that. There's, there's a sanin of it. Maybe some phrases have weakness in the chain, and other phrases, the chains are fine. Um, seven, multiplier, there's a reward multiplier. Talking about multiplying your portfolio, making your, you know, your, your Bitcoin. Forget Bitcoin. It's another one of the jokes they're playing on, on, in the world. It's fake. Crypto, what does that mean? It's virtual, virtual. The, 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 the paper notes they have are not real currency. They're, a crypt, they're what a fiat currency. They don't have intrinsic value. They, they used to represent something that had intrinsic value. Gold and silver have intrinsic value. But then they flipped the script and changed the, the system. There's not even gold backing that up anymore. Crypto, what's backing up? Allahu alam, yani. Some geek that sits, you know, playing video games too much organized it. I'm sorry, Yanni, but like falsehood, like where's the reality of what really matters in the world right now? And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us to uh, really adhere to the way the real. So he said, Lola ashukka ala ummati la amartuhum bisiwak in the kuli wudu. Prophet sallallahu said, um, if I were not to be difficult on my ummah, I would have ordered them to do suwak and every wudu. That's narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, Mali arakum tadkhuluna alayya kulhan istaku. Uh, why do I see you come in and you have yellow teeth, meaning like tartar or yellow things on your teeth, yellow uh, plaque on your teeth? Uh, he said, do siwak, oral hygiene. Allah's Messenger ﷺ taught that 1400 years ago to Bedouins. Sallallahu alayhi wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Um, so you could take this anywhere. This, this is civilization, right? This is civilization, not the, the veneer of civilization that you see other places. This is civilization. And this is a civilization that doesn't come unglued when you're a conqueror. This civilization, you, you could stand on the door of the Kaaba and say, what am I going to do now after you did what you did to me? 21 years into his message. You're going to do good because you're civilized. You're a good brother and a son of a good brother. These other civilizations, just ask the Native Americans what happens, right, when there's a conqueror. This is, this is how you civilize a human being, right? Um, and it's Allah's messenger, so I said them, by prophecy, we connect to the real high meanings of our humanity and are raised from states that are like animals, right, that are worse than animals. When you just follow your caprices, it's an I'm just, I just always do what I want. You're going to become worse than an animal with the other. But I'm, I would become worse than an animal with the other. But But if we follow than him, follow him. Some of the kibar of them become better than angels. Some of the elites. Generally, angels are better than the believers, right? But some of the elites, certainly the prophets, are better than angels, right? Um, that's the the way that Allah bequeathed you, Umm of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, and uh, she says, Aisha radhiyallahu anha, kana yastak. Kulla layla miraran. Another son of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi He would do siwak numerous times through the night. When he would awaken, he would remember Allah. Right? The believer is always ready to remember Allah. So the believer, he sallallahu alaihi wasallam, would roll over and wake up at night, and he would remember Allah when he would awaken at night, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right? He would big wake up, khalas. Last, he might recite the last ten of Surah Al Imran, along with many, many other dhikrs. Of, um, of waking up. So, um, so you do siwak throughout the night. She says in a hadith of Muslim, the first thing he did when he came in the house was do siwak. Right? And there's a meaning. Husbands, your wives like you to be affectionate. You don't like your wife to smell bad. She doesn't like you to smell bad. Right? Being fragrant, being affectionate with your wife, your spouse, that is a sunnah. 
Prophet Muhammad, he had nine wives at a given time. He would enter and see every one of them, and he would come close to her and be affectionate. Right? You're going to come upon her with bad breath? You're not. Right? You're going to have adab like Rasulullah, but there's, a deep, there's deep meanings in that. Don't just be a brute at home. Come home and, you know, see, whack yourself, give your wife a little kiss. Right? And then go on with, and, you know, offload some of the drama that you just had of the stress at work. And wives, receive them like that. You do see whack, pretty yourself up, put on some perfume, you know, let him, co let him come home to Jamal because he should, he, if he's a hard working man, he's just come out of Jalal. Right? And then you have a house that's a tajelli of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala producing believers that are harmonious, right? Not at war with one another and, you know, trying to really, who wants you and you to be at war with your spouse? Shaitan. He hates us, right? So these ideologies that teach you to war at home, what are they? Misanthropic. This is where we got. They hate humanity, human hating ideologies. They're anti, and who's the, the king of the anti human madhab? Shaitan. So if someone's got a madhab like the second wave feminism, we'll just we'll say, I'm sorry, I gotta be real. I'm, I'm in reality right now. This time is time for reality for the fakir. Something that makes women and men war, who's behind that? Iblis is behind that. Some, something that makes men and women cooperate in khilafah, that's the Qur'an, right? So may Allah give us to follow the Qur'an. So brothers, when you go home and you, get, you come in to see your wife, have good oral hygiene. It's the sunnah of your prophet and the hadith of Muslim. Say it's an Aisha, one of the last things she did in the, the, actually, like, one of the very last things in the life of Allah's messenger was say it's an Aisha, moistened and softened a siwak for him, and he did see whack before he died. It's from her, she considered it from her manaqib that Allah combined her saliva with that of Allah's messenger when he died, so he said him. And he died leaning against her chest. Like, what kind of harmony is that? And really, modern world, here we go. He died leaning on his 18-year-old wife's chest. Allahu Akbar. She lives 60 years after him and gives us, according to Ibn Hajar, a quarter of the Sharia is from her. That's a far-sighted plan. I'm about to take this intelligent, pure-hearted girl, rear her up as my protege, especially in things to women, but also in other things. Aisha was a lexicologist. Aisha was a doctor. Aisha was a genealogist. Aisha was a jurist. Aisha was a commander, radiallahu ta'ala anha. How would she not be? And one of the last things that happened was her saliva was united with that of Allah's messenger, so he When her final hours were, were Malik al Mot coming in and saying, or within his final hours, angel of death came in and asked for permission. Aisha said, yeah, that angel didn't feel like Jibril. We talked about haq yakin. They're there. They're not like, it's not thinking about it, like he said in Taburullah ka'anna katarahu, she's not thinking about it, she's experiencing it, right? She, she's in haq yakin, she's siddiqah, right? So, oh, well, we don't like that she's so much younger. Who asked you? Her creator created her for that, and, you know, she's memorialized by the Sharia, Allahu Akbar. Anyway, sunnas, siwak, before you come in your house, or when you first come in your house, siwak, prior to dying, to sunnah. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it prior to going to the highest company. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they mention like 70 benefits of siwak, as Shabrini al-Khatib mentions it in Mughni. One of them is it reminds you of saying Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah at the time of death. The siwak. How do they know that? The inside of the Hasalahin, I believe. I don't believe that's from a hadith. But doing it at the time of death is from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Ali ibn Abbas said, Allah's messenger continued to order us to do siwak until we thought he was going to make it, um, uh, that some uh, command would be revealed concerning it. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do siwak for it purifies the mouth and pleases the Lord. That is narrated by Ibn Habban in his sahih. Um, and a similar version is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim in one of the versions and it angers the shaitan. Right? Pleases the Lord and angers the shaitan. Look at the theme. And uh, did someone mention that? In, in one of the sessions that we're fighting shaitan. 
we're fighting shaitan in this, right? He's, a, he's an enemy. May Allah allow us to take him as an enemy. And uh, Ali bin Abi Talib said, uh, we're going to skip that one, um, just for brevity's sake. The Prophet Sallallahu um, his companions, they would go forth and see wax were behind their ears. They'd go forth in that day, go out in the afternoon. They used to carry their siwak like that. Like brothers would carry, you know, pencil, carpenters would carry pencil. They're, they're like tradesmen of the, the way of the hereafter. Carpenter used to have a pencil. Nowadays, I don't know what they draw with, but you see he's got a pencil here, pencil here. Sahaba had see wax right there, right? This is something that pleases my Lord. This is something that helps me pray, helps me recite the book. I have this close by, right? They didn't have maybe pockets. They stuck it behind their ears. Radiallahu anhu wa adahum. So then he's mentioning uh, the way you do siwak is do siwak with the khashab of Iraq. This is Iraq, right? This, this type of wood that they sell now generally, sometimes, especially Africans, you'll find they sell uh, licorice root. But this type of, uh, this is a shrub. It's like, it's like chaparral of the Middle East, of, the, of Southern Arabia. Um, it has little berries. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi used to eat them when he was a, a shepherd. Um, and, uh, and it's very pungent. Um, and, uh, and these are actually the roots, right? This Iraq, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said it's the best um, type of siwak. So if you buy a siwak, it's likely to be that. But again, your toothbrush is a siwak. Your, wash, your washcloth in the shower is a siwak. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So then he said uh, that it is recommended to do siwak with every salah, every wudu. Um, when, when your, uh, anytime your breath changes, right? Anytime you have bad breath, it's sunnah to do siwak. Um, and uh, there are various causes of that. And there are many other times that are sunnah. You're going to find those listed in a legal manual. Also, you're going to find differences of opinion in your legal manuals about when it's best to do. So the Shafis are going to say, do it with wudu, and do it right before the takbir of each salah. The Hanafis aren't going to tell you to do the latter, but Allah knows best. They might include it in the former, that we'll do, doing it for wudu, that takes you all the way to that siwak for that salah. In any case, those are, as we mentioned yesterday, accurate, they're sound judgments, meaning according, not according to, as I said, I'm just said, I'm just doing what I want, no. Someone that looks into the oceans of the book and the sunnah based on the principles um, that they, uh, they understood how to derive law from the book and the sunnah independently. Those great imams like Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, uh, Shafi'i, Ahmad, and others. Um, and they, under, they take from that the details that each of us needs to worship, right? Um, so Abu Hanifa will tell you to do it one way, Shafi'i will tell you to do it the other way. I'm only referencing those two because that's a difference of opinion I know. Um, the, the Malikis might tell you something else. And just take that as uh, the understanding of the book and the sunnah according to um, Imam Malik and understand also that in this affair, there is breath. There's a whole lot of breath in the Sharia of Nabi Muhammad. He was sent with al hanafiyyah to samha right? It's, uh, it's upright and adherent to the truth. That's what Hanif means, right? Inclining to the truth and adhering to it, holding fast to it, that's Hanif. And it's samha, it's magnanimous. Right? Like, alhamdulillah, I'm traveling to Raqqa's door, to Raqqa's asr, in the earlier time, in the later time. Alhamdulillah. Right? Alhamdulillah for the Sharia of Nabi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So then after Siwak, when I was taking these books, Sayyidat Habib Omar, he would, an hour-long lesson would be siwak. Like, sunnah of wudu, boom, siwak. Right? How do you hold siwak? Hold it like this. Hold it in your right hand. Do the upper first, lower. We're not going to go into all of that. Have a fiqh lesson. Have a fiqh lesson. Learn how to do it. And again, the madahib may differ some in their understanding from, of what the sunnahs are of that. So then he said, when you finish siwak, Sit for wudu. You understand from this, Imam Ghazali is putting siwak as a sunnah of wudu for before wudu. That is one position. In that case, it requires an intention. So you could intend siwak for wudu, for example, or siwak for dhikr, and wudu is going to include dhikr. Um, and then he begins the sunnahs of wudu uh, and etiquettes before wudu. He says, sit. Sitting is a sunnah for wudu, standing is a sunnah for ghusl. Face the qibla, as mentioned. Uh, that was mentioned in Adab Qala. How do you know the Qibla? You should always know the Qibla. You shouldn't go anywhere where you don't know the Qibla. It's actually haram to travel without knowing the Qibla where you're going or a way to find it. 
haram. This, this, the travel itself is haram, and if you did that, like we said, I could shorten prayers, you can't shorten prayers, because your journey is sinful. Ma fi ruksa. Right? So learn the Qibla. Nowadays, we've got an app, right? But also just learn, like, when you're somewhere, know the Qibla in that area. Like, we used to take shuyukh and serve them. One of the first things that should be known if you're taking care of a, a guest, like Habib Hussein comes, you put him in a room, like, it's nice, give him a nice bed, alhamdulillah. Maybe you might find him sleeping on the floor. Show him where the Qibla is in that room, if he's new to the place, right? Give him a prayer rug, face it towards, and again, he may be carrying a way to do it. Right? But knowing the Qibla, we should know the Qibla. It's the most noble of directions. Turning towards it is, is an indication of turning away from everything else and turning towards Allah. Like, look at how mindful of the creation the Sharia of Prophet Muhammad would make us if we adhere to it. Like, our kids now, we got to watch our kids in these devices. It's ruining their sense of direction. I drive with young men, it's terrifying. Like, they're, they're like, as if, like, it's just, this is telling you where to go. I'm like, dude, you had to at least put it up on the dashboard. When I was 15 and I was in driver's ed, they taught me high aim driving. Like look way up high so you're seeing way down and then your, your, your vision will naturally show you what's close. But like road hazards, miles up, you see them. This brother's looking like this. Yeah, <laughs> Latif, Yanni. And, but I mean, teach them how to use their, their device to know where the Qibla is so they can face it. But also teach them other ways. The sun's going this way. North Star's there. Inshallah ta'ala. You go out in the woods, know the Qibla. Got to do what you had on the Qibla before you go to the bathroom. What? So you don't disrespect the noblest of directions. So you're someone who's always walking cognizant of the sacred. Right? Not just profane. Yeah, you just, just take these resources and use some of them. And as soon as it doesn't fit the bottom line, just throw them away and pollute the world. Like, how, how disgusting is that? That's what, that's what the companies we work for, that's how they think. Versus someone, I'm walking in the forest, where's the Qibla? Where's this fruit tree so I don't, I don't make it hard for someone else? Look at the difference in the Ibadah Rahman, right? How Ibadah Rahman al-ladhina yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna, right? It's a totally different reality. That's why we say, just put yourself aside, follow on Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu He'll lead us into a beautiful reality that's beloved to Allah. That's beloved. There's fish in that water down there. And I know it because Abdul Malik caught a big old trout. He told me he was so happy. He ran up and showed it to Sheikh Yahya, took it right up into the offices up here. Those fish, if you're following this way, they're praying for your forgiveness. All of these creatures, if you're following this way, they're happy about you. Like, you're not someone who came to desecrate this. You're someone that it celebrates. Well, by just by doing it, by following the Nabi Muhammad. So that's why we're so tough on, like, corporations. If you, if you adhere to the Sharia of Muhammad, mumkin. We could use Tijar. We love Tijar. But if you don't, forget that. I'm not letting you desecrate the sacred and my humanity, my fitra, for your bottom line. And if I have, like these brothers of Jamali, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, if I have to smack you in the face, I will, if it's permissible. But you're not going to desecrate the Sharia, right? These brothers wouldn't say that, and I wouldn't do it, right? Abdurrahman Meshwar, though, someone got outside of Adab, no, that's not it. One of the sultans said, tomorrow's Ramadan. Tomorrow's not Ramadan. The sultans of the hereafter don't bow to the sultans of the dunya. That was in Tirim too, where they don't carry weapons, nothing like that. Right? And I'll, we'll go back to Jamal, because we're in Jamali. We're representing Sheikh Yahya. I'm about to become real Jamali. La ilaha illallah. Allah bless him. He's representing us. I, I promise you, during this weekend, he visited the Fakir Makadam and prayed for you all. If not multiple times. Hafidhullah. <laughs> Okay, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Allah Masalli wa Sallam, Barakali All right, so we still have 26 minutes if we go our extra 15. Is that correct? Yep. La ilaha illallah. Okay, so we'll do um, sit, you face the Qibla, the most noble of directions. Then he begins, okay, for we'll do, we're going to go through this. This is we'll do according to a great Shafi'i jurist. 
Some of the details are going to be different than your medhab. Due to its importance, we're going to go through it. Another point, this is one of his earlier works. He, he was the most prestigious lecturer at the most prestigious institute of his time. And Nidhamiya, right? He left it. He left it for 10 years and secluded himself and worked on his heart. During that time, and he spent time in Dimashq, right? They even know the room where he was. Um, you know, he authored this and he came out of that with this. And then, you know, he eventually returned and he settled um, in his original uh, place of Tuls, right? After that, he authored other works like Bidayat al Hidayah. In Bidayat al Hidayah, we know he authored it after Ihya because he always references Ihya. This is basics, and then I'm, if you want to go deeper, go there. In Bidayat al Hidayah, which is a later work, the, the du'as of wudu are a little bit longer and different. So if I were going to advise you to memorize these du'as of wudu, I would advise you to take them from the beginning of guidance, not from Ihya. What's in this is, is shorter than what we memorized from Bidayat al Hidayah. Um, so just pay attention to that point. Uh, and then another point while we're on the, on the topic of other references, Bidayat al Hidayah is translated. There's a very good translation. Um, the one that uh, Mecca Books has, it's a good translation, mashallah. And it also has facing Arabic. You could take like a uh, manila envelope or, you know, something nice, like nice paper. You could paste it where you do wudu, and you could write out all of these du'as of wudu. And then it'd take you a few days, you'd, you'd be doing like five, ten minute wudus, reading those du'as. But after a little while, you'd memorize the du'as of wudu. Um, another work that you can benefit from, it's a work by Sayyid al-Habib Omar, The Glorious Treasure. And in The Glorious Treasure, he has a lot of dhikrs of wudu with the hadith evidence. And some of them are from the sahih, like the sahih of Al-Imam al-Bukhari. And Imam Haddad says, and this is our methodology, that when there is an, a, a text from the Prophet Sallallahu that should be given preference, right? That which is a sounder hadith should be given preference in dhikr. So you find like the uh, Wudu Latif just full of hadith. It's just all hadith. So what's in Glorious Treasure is uh, he's citing the textual evidence and also it's shorter versions. So for us English speakers without huge memories, it's, it's easier but also, you're going to be memorizing the explicit phrases that are in the hadith, whereas some of these adhkar are longer. There's additions uh, from maybe hadith that aren't in the sahih or maybe from some of the ulama. So it'll, you'll find it easier, but you also might say it's even more conservative and in adherence to the methodology of al Imam Haddad. For those that want to follow that, for those that do follow that, you'll benefit from those two books. You'll benefit from Glorious Treasure. Um, and the hadith evidence for the, for the wudu dhikrs there, and you'll benefit from Bidayat till Hidayah, uh, later works of Al-Imam al So then he says, uh, you begin wudu, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there's no wudu for someone who does not mention Allah Ta'ala, um, and meaning that is no complete wudu, it's narrated by Abu Dawood, at Tirmidhi and others. And then also uh, he said, and this Allah knows best, this is from... Uh, from the du'a of uh, the Qur'an and the insight in the, to the Sharia of Imam Haddad, not a specific narration that I memorized that's reached me, though there's a whole lot that hasn't, of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu saying to make this du'a at that point, I seek refuge in you from the insinuations of demons, and I seek refuge that they be present with me. That's a du'a from the Qur'an against demons. Uh, purification is one of the times demons flock around and try to distract you. So, and, and in general, we need to seek refuge in Allah from them. And we'll do is also, as we'll see in the end, one of our great shields against them. So um, look how many ta'awwuds you have in a day. You had, a ta you had seeking refuge going to the bathroom, seeking refuge at the beginning of wudu, seeking refuge um, so many other times. Every time you recite Fatiha, uh, Allah, or every time you recite Quran, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. So then he says, uh, so you begin bismillah, you could add this du'a to it, wash your hands thrice. Uh, and he said, prior to putting them in a vessel, because they used to scoop out of vessels, but what if your hands are dirty? So you don't stick your dirty hands into a vessel of clean water. You pour some water out or scoop some water out real quick and wash them out, right? Especially after you've slept, because you might have touched an area of your body that's impure while sleeping. So the first thing you should do when you wake up is make wudu. Prophet Muhammad said, but don't stick your hand right in the water. It's actually makru at that point. Um, 
And then he says to make this dua. And these duas are an area of difference of opinion. Because the hadith evidence isn't terribly strong for them. So these are called dua al-a'da. And you find them in the manuals of al-imam al-ghazali. You find them in the books of the Shafi'i school. Like literally praying about each of your organs and limbs while you're washing that limb. They're beautiful duas. However, the jurists and the scholars of hadith discuss the strength of the hadith evidence, thus the legal, um, the legal ruling for saying those duas. So some of them will say labats. It's permissible. We're not say, we can't say it's recommended because we don't understand a sanction from Prophet Muhammad so he to recommend an injunction, actually, to recommend it. That, that shows you what? The scrupulousness of the ulama. I'm not going to tell you something's recommended if I don't know Prophet Muhammad or I can't be confident enough that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said it, right? But then later, um, like Imam Ramli, who's late, he's a late Shafi'i, later than Imam Anoui. Imam Anoui is going to say Labas. Imam Ramli is going to say Laha Turuk. There are various pathways that give the Hadith strength. So he'll say it's recommended, right? Um, and, and the Malikis, do the Malikis say it's recommended? I remember brothers saying to do istighfar. I don't, I don't know where they got that. Anyway, uh, these are du'as. Um, oh Allah, I ask you for blessing and goodness, a good fortune, you might say, and I seek refuge in you from, uh, from uh, that which is uh, not blessed and fortunate, that which is like a bad omen, and destruction. So he's saying, washing your hands. And then he says, then intend uh, making uh, your intention. This then intend, the later books wouldn't say it like this. The later books would say, intend sunnahs of wudu while beginning your hands. So you're rewarded because a'malu bin niyat. And then intend the obligation while washing your face. That's what the later books are going to say. A simple intention that they teach the kids, they teach the common people in tarim is, nawaitu at taharata lis salah. I intend purification for salat, or you could say, I intend purification for prayer. That's a very strong intention, and it's a simple intention, and it will work for wudu and ghusl. So if you're following this, or you know you want to uh, follow that ijtihad, uh, an excellent intention, the way to tahara, lis salat. It also reminds us what we do. I'm intending purification to stand in the state where I commune with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and then he says... Uh, um, and then take a handful to wash your mouth and gargle um, and wash it all the way back to uh, the back of your mouth unless you're fasting. Be careful. Don't go so far back that it might go down. If it does go down and, and you did that negligently, you'll, it'll break your fast. Uh, and he says, unless you're fasting, be easy. Um, and then say this dua. Allahumma inni ala tidawati kitabati o kathur dhikri lek. He adds in bidayat to the hidayat. Wa thabitni bil qawla thabiti fil hayat dunya wal akhirah. Allah, help me recite your book, remember you a lot, make me firm on the firm world, on the firm word, on the firm word in this life, and the akhirah. What is the firm word? The firm word is la ilaha illallah. Um, as Suhra Wardi adds with each of these du'as in Awaraf al-Ma'arif, send salawat on Prophet Muhammad before saying the du'a. So you say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, wa inni ala tilabati kikabika, wa kathrati dhikri lak, wa thabitni bil qawli thabati. So you're washing your mouth, Asking him to use your mouth properly, right? Um, and alhamdulillah, and also with uh, Suhra Wardi's advice, connecting your, your mouth and yourself to the mention of the Habib, sallallahu right? So Habib's shown and given your salawat uh, that you made in that wudu, alhamdulillah, and um, with shukr. And then he said, uh, and then take a handful for your nose uh, and um, rinse your nose three times, raise the water up, and then expel it. Um, actually, the, the hadith of Ali is the soundest hadith related to that, as the Shafis understand it. And they say it's best to take one handful, rinse your mouth, and from the same handful, rinse your nose, and that's one. But if you went one, two, three, one, one two, three, that'll be fine. But the best way uh, in, in, in the ijtihad of, of the Shafis, according, because of the hadith evidence from Ali, radiallahu anhu, they say to do it uh, what's called wasl, which is to connect the mouth and nose in the same handful while um, doing 
ablution. So then when you wash, uh, take water into your nose, this prince has, has ojidni. What I memorize is arih, uh, arihni. And that's what's in Bidayat al Hidayah. Allahumma arihni ra'ihat al Jannah wa anta anni rad. Oh Allah, when you rinse your mouth, when you, excuse me, when you take water into your nose, right? And you're probably going to have to say after you've expelled it, say both, right? Unless you could say, say dua while water's in your nose. Um, <laughs> maybe right before. Allahumma arihni ra'ihat al Jannah. Oh Allah, give me to smell the fragrance of paradise while you're pleased with me. And then when you expel, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa a'udhu bika min rawai hinnar wa min su'id dar. O Allah, I seek refuge in you from the stench of hellfire and a wretched abode. When you expel, you seek refuge. Um, and then he says, uh, and then take a handful of water for your face. So hopefully you all will read through this. I'm not going to read it all because it's, these are like minute details about your face and its hairs. Uh, from the Shafi'i manuals. How many hairs do you have on your face? 20 types of hair. This is one, 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 these are some, these are some. All different types of hairs. You have these spaces, especially a man with a receding hairline, they might go way back. Are those from the head or are those from the face? That's what he's talking about here. What, what do we want to take from this? Okay, Sufis, look how precise about the Sharia this Imam is, right? If our tasawwuf makes us negligent in the Sharia, it's not tasawwuf, it's something else, right? It's, it's, you know, I don't know what, but it's something else. These Imams, their way, his shiuch, or, or, or shiuch, and you know, I'm, you know, he has his own saluk, he knows the details of that. Shaykh Abdul Rahman, how did he define a Sufi? Faqihun amila bi ilmihi fa'awrathahullahu ilma ma lam ya'lam. Person of religious learning who acted on his knowledge, Allah bequeathed him knowledge of what he didn't know. That's how he defines a Sufi. An alim amil, right? Who has a fat, and then Allah teaches him directly in different ways. Our shuyukh, uh, their methodology, the way of Sa'da al Balawi, they're going to say, your path is ilm, amal, wara, khawf min Allah, and ikhlas. Knowledge, practice, scrupulousness, fear of Allah, and certitude. Right? Um, la ilaha illallah. So look at the scholars of Tasawwuf, how precise they are in the Sharia. Regardless of your madhab, just observe what he talks about the hairs. So some of oh, this is just outward, it's not important. Kaif is not important. This is what Prophet Muhammad said. You're not important. Prophet Muhammad is important. Every, every single thing he said, hatta al is important. Ex everything Prophet Muhammad said, even that you rest more on your left foot than your right foot when relieving yourself, it's important. Anything that contradicts that is like what he said. It's from your own self. Just leave it. So you could become important and know what's really important and be placed in paradise where everything you want happens. You lived your life subverting it to what Allah willed, and He placed you in paradise where now you have kun fayakun. How'd you get like that? By following Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He'll lead you to that. To being someone like the awliya, they talk about tasarruf, disposal in Allah's creation. What is their tasarruf? Their tasarruf is they have no more will. So everything that they will happens because they only will what Allah's will. They have it in the dunya, what every believer, all of you, you all believers, you're going to go to paradise, inshallah. That's my dhan of you. I don't lose by having that dhan. I can't claim, I can't judge for Allah, but I hope that I have, I ask Allah to see in my heart that I have a dhan of all of you believers, you're going to go to paradise. If you're in paradise, everything you wish happens. But here, nope. Nope. You're a slave and you've got to constantly go against your own will for what Allah ordered you to do, uh, like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. So may Allah give us to do that. Um, so then he mentions, you wash your face, you wash it three times, you say this dua, Allahumma bayyad wajhi bi nurika yawma tabiyadu wuju awliyaika ula tusawwidu wajhi bi dhulamatika yawma tusawwidu wujuhu a'da'ik. 
and add as Surah already said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa bayil wajhi. He said, then wash your face and uh, say this beautiful prayer. O oh Allah, brighten my face with your light on the day that the faces that, that, that the faces of your friends, your awliya, are brightened, and do not darken my face with uh, bulumat, your darknesses, right? Like the absence of light on the day that uh, the faces of your enemies are darkened, right? Um, la ilaha illallah. And there's a point I want to bring out here to... Um, so that's a dua you could say with your face, asking Allah to have a bright face with the awliya. Allegiance with the awliya, rejection of the way of the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and we have enemies. We made for every prophet enemies, devils of mankind and jinn who incite one another with sedu seductive speech. Don't think that, you know, you could just skip around and it's a fairy tale. There's enemies devils of mankind and jinn. Allah protect us from them. Amen. You all really have enemies. Maqasid, you all really have enemies. Because you're doing what shaitan hates. He hates to see people learn Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Shariah. He hates, and I know from Sheikh Yahya's intentions, he wants your hearts to come together. Shaitan hates that. So in, you read uh, Minhaj al Abidin, he's going to say, if you're traveling this way, he's going to make you an, a special enemy. You're going to be on his short list, right? You're going to be on his hit list. So we, got to, we have to fortify ourselves, right? And also learn his tricks. Don't let him come between you and your brothers and sisters. Don't let him, you couples, don't let him come between you and your spouse because that's what he's trying to do with the other billah ta'ala, right? Um, Allah protect us from his enemies. And well, let us not be like his enemies. Let us be like his friends. So there's a point here that we just want to bring out. And the point uh, that I want to make, we said in the beginning that knowledge isn't taken from books. It's taken from breasts, right? It's stored in books. By Allah's permission, Ustad Amjad, Shaykh Yahya, Sayyid al-Fatah, khalas, by blood and by, by um, knowledge. Allah privileged them, and uh, inshallah, your poor brother, to witness people, it's like they walked out of Ihya. It's like so much that I'm reading, I'm like, oh, that's where Habib Mashur got that. That's where Habib Omar got that. Alhamdulillah. Jazah Sheikh, Sheikh Yahya Khairan and Jazah Stad Amja that we read through this. He outlined it, made me look at, look into this great repository to get the details of what I've been watching these men do for like 20 some years. Alhamdulillah, I had the opportunity to watch Sayyidah Habib Omar do wudu once. And he did what do like really gentle, like not, you know, not some. I remember Sheikh Yahya said, said he saw him once. He said it was just so easy going, like it was thorough, but like latif, yani. As he mentioned, like being pers too persnickety, that's not the way of people of, of deep knowledge, right? But at one point he washed his face, and then he went like this, which is a sunnah. Check these inner corners of the eye, outward corners of the eye. It's a sunnah. And it's obligatory if you're afraid there's matter in there that will block the water, right? I just noticed him do that. Oh, that's interesting, you know. So then I find this hadith today um, that he said, place your finger, this is Imam Ghazali, place your finger in the outer corners and the inner corners of, or the corners of the eyes, which is where matter uh, gathers and also where kohu, antimony will gather. Clean it, right? Because that has been narrated from the Prophet, it's been narrated that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did that. Um, and then what did I find? The hadith is narrated by Ahmed from Abu Umama, Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would wipe those. Um, and just uh, the point I want to make is just the subtle attention to Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sunnah, right? Uh, and alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah ala dhalika. Um, la ilaha illallah. They said, didn't wash your arms. Arms is not from your wrist to your elbow. It's a common mistake that slips in from translation to the world, to the ideas of those of us that English, speak English primarily. So if we already washed our hands, when you say wash your arms, I saw even one of my kids doing this. What do you understand? You understand from your wrist to your elbow. Many people understand that. In Arabic, 
Yed, which is what Allah orders you to wash, is from here to here, is Yed. From your fingertips to your shoulder, all of that's Yed. In Wudu, Yed is from your fingertips to just above your elbows onto your bicep. That's what you have to wash. So at this point, even though you already washed your hands, before you stuck them in the vessel, before you touched the water you're putting in your mouth, you washed your hands three times. It's your kefain. You can call that kef, right? That means just this, kef. You wash those. Even though you already washed that, you're going to wash from here to here at this point. So he said, then wash your arms three times. Move your uh, ring. Why? So water goes under it. Again, look at his concern for detail. Um, and extend the radiant area. Uh, all the way up. Um, and what is the radiant area? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, I long to see my brothers. Aren't we your brothers? No, you're my companions. My brothers are people who believe in me, though they didn't see me. And they said, how, they said, how will you know them? And he said, uh, if a man had a horse with a blaze and a horse with socks. What are socks on a horse? Socks are white feet. And a blaze is the white on its face. Arabs call that ghurra for the face, muhajjal, or tahjil and muhajjaleen for the person who has it in a grammatical case. He said, they, wouldn't a, a man know his horse with its blaze among horses that didn't have that? He said that, that you, they will be resurrected with these radiant extremities in their faces and their extremities from wudu, and I will be what? Farat. Farat is the scout who goes ahead of campers and, and prepares the watering places for the, the, them and their animals. I'll be waiting for them at my watering place. So these are signs by which your Prophet knows you on Yom al Qiyamah, and inshallah, you all are from his brothers. May Allah make all of us from his brothers um, who he knows. So do I have four minutes or four minutes? And that's with my extra 15, or do I have. That's, that's with my extra 15. Okay, we got to. Allah, we ask a lot of do barakah in this time. La ilaha illallah. So he said, extend the area of light. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ said, one of you is able to extend the area of light in his face, let him do that. That hadith is sahih. Um, and he said, wash first your right hand. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa atini kitabi bi yamini wa hasibni hisab al yasira. Wash with your right and say, oh Allah, um, give me an easy judgment. And give me my book in my right hand and give me an easy judgment. Washes with his right, he extends the area of light on his right side, or she extends the area of right on her right side. Wash with your left, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika and tu'atini bi kitabi bi shimali umin wa dhahri. O Allah, I seek refuge that you give me my book in my left or from behind my back. Details of the hands, take them from your fiqh lesson. Does water under your, uh, does water under, dirt under your fingernails affect it? How do you comb between your fingers? Do you rub? All of that, take it in your fiqh lesson. Uh, and then he says, wash your whole head. Wash your whole head. There's a principle here. Avoid differences of opinions with other schools. Maliki school says it's obligatory. It's makru not to do it in the Shafi school. He's going to describe to you, touch your fingertips, put your thumbs on your temples. Go like that. That's for, uh, back to front. If your hair turns over, my hair's long enough, it's turning over right now. Front to back, that's one. And they also mention wipe your... your, your uh, Wipe your ears when you do that. So do your head. Um, someone whose hair is really long, like a woman, you wouldn't go flip back. And also you'd want to wipe all the way to the end of your hair. Um, and each one of those counts as one. In the madhab of this author, he's going to say to do it three times. That's the Shafi school. Imam al-Haddad, what I memorized from his amal, he still did it once. And other madhab says to do it once. Uh, do a dua. Uh, when you wipe your head, Allahumma ghashini bi rahmatika wa anzil alayya min barakatika wa adhillini tahda dhilli arshika yawma la dhilla illa dhilak. O Allah, envelop me in your mercy, uh, cause your blessings to descend upon me, shade me beneath the shade of your throne on a day when there's no shade other than your shade. Allahu Akbar. He said, then wash uh, your ears, the, uh, the outward and the inward. What's the inside of your ear? The part we see. Because your ears were like this at one point. The outside of your ear is the back, right? That's the outside, this is the inside. So he said, uh, wipe your ears and the ear canals and the back with your thumbs. That counts as one. You're going to do it three times. In sunnahs, you'll do more. Allahumma jalni min aladhini yastami'una al-qawla fa yattabi'una ahsana. Allahumma smi'ni munadi al-jannah fil jannah ma'al abrar. O Allah, make me of those who hear the word and follow the best thereof. O Allah, give me to hear the caller to paradise along with the pious. Then he says to wipe the neck. That is a difference of opinion in the school. 
a tahqiq in the hashiyas of the later school, like the hashiyah of the Qurdi, is it should be recommended because they don't do taqlid of Imam Nawawi in that hadith, not having a sound chain, enough of a chain for it to be sunnah. Imam Nawawi said it was makru, but Imam Ghazali and later muhakkikin of the school, like Ali, uh, the Qurdi, the sahib of the author of the hashi, hashi al Madaniya, he's going to say it's sunnah. Um, and then wipe your neck and say, Allahumma fukka raqabati min anna wa a'udhu bika min as salasil wa laqlal. Oh Allah, uh, liberate my neck from the fire and I seek refuge in you from chains and yokes. What's yoke? You guys watch Urshigal, don't you? Some of you watch it. They put like a piece of wood around your neck with a big hole and two little holes. And your hands are yoked up on your neck like that. They did them like that. They torture people like, you see stuff for a lot of pictures of slavery, they do people like that. People will have yokes on Yom Qiyamah, some people, yeah. So he asked Allah, don't give me a yoke on Yom Qiyamah, liberate my neck from that. Then he says, wash your right foot three times, comb between your toes with your left little pinky, little finger, wash your left three times as well, say, oh Allah, make my feet firm on your path, the day uh, that, uh, that feet slip into the fire, and I seek refuge in you that my feet slip uh, into the fire on the day that this, the feet of uh, the hypocrite slip. So he says all of that, do that, and then also wash further up your legs. Extending what? Your tahjil, which is like what? The socks of a horse. It, radiant, bright extremities. Radiant, bright legs and feet. Radiant, bright uh, arms. Radiance around and bigger around the face that Al-Habib Sallallahu will see. And then he's going to say to make these du'as, and I'm not going to read this version. I'm going to read the version that's in the Glorious Treasure because it's what I memorized and because it's shorter. Uh, you can reference this if you're referencing the Arabic. But he's going to say, um, but these hadith are just Allahu Akbar. So he's going to say, raise your head to the sky. That's in the hadith. I know it from Bushra al-Karim and from the actions of our shiuch, but it's in the hadith, right? This hadith... Uh, is narrated by, um, this hadith is narrated by, and actually he doesn't cite it. Does he cite it? No, he doesn't cite it. Um, I saw it though, preparing. Anyway, uh, raise your head and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna sayyidina muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Allahumma jalni min at-tawabin wa jalni min al-mutahirin Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka. Um, though that is we'll do with uh, some of its sunnahs, some of its dhikrs. Uh, inshallah, we're going to come back to some of its virtues just because they're so immense. And we'll connect that with this, some of our, oh, translate. The reward of the death. Oh, the reward of that, thank you. So uh, someone who says that first dua and it is in Muslim. That's another point we said. If you're going to take a, a, a fa'idah from this, make wudu when you, when you relieve yourself. That hadith of Ibn Majah. If we do that, it'll, it'll affect our saluk so much. Second fa'idah is that. After you do wudu, let's make an agreement. And these hadith, them being recited, are covenants. These are manifestations of the renewal of our covenant with Allah that the Prophet ﷺ came and brought. Um, he said, if someone makes wudu, and says, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashhadu anna Sayyidina Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. That short version of the shahadatain that perhaps all of us memorize. Someone who does it when they will do wudu, all eight doors of heaven are open for them and they can enter through whichever one they wish. Look at the key Prabhu Muhammad gave us. Eight doors of paradise open for you. You go there, just say shahada after wudu. It's like, Al-Hanafiyyah to Samha. Look how merciful the Habib is. So that's, uh, we're concluding with that. Jazakallah khair for reminding me. Glorious Treasure has the Hadith evidence in the footnotes. It's translated, it's transliterated for all of those other du'as too. There's some immense reward in those du'as. And we'll come through a few more points with permission of the organizer. I'm going to restructure a little bit. We'll do is one of the long, longies that we really wanted to cover in this. Forgive me for going a little bit long. Afwa minkum wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-Fatiha.